Uh, good afternoon. I am Adam Porter. I am chair of the Beverly Hills Bar Mediation Section. I am so pleased you are joining us this afternoon um, for our presentation on advising clients um, to apologize and forgive. Um, in a moment, I'll introduce our speaker, Professor Emeritus from Pepperdine University Law School, Peter Robinson. Um, I first want to mention that you know Peter and I have been friends for a long time, and I'm so pleased that Peter has agreed to give this talk for us. Um, I want to mention that the Beverly Hills Bar Association mediation section is very active, and we have a lot of very talented mediators. And if you need mediation services, please keep in mind um, those mediators. Um, Peter Robinson received his bachelor's degree from UC San Diego in the field of economics, his law degree from Hastings College of the Law. Peter was the director of the Christian Conciliation Service of Los Angeles um, before joining Pepperdine in 1990. Peter was the managing director of the Strauss Institute from 2005 through 2018. Um, Peter was my instructor for the mediation seminar. So yeah, Peter, I may negotiate a better grade with you um, after the course. So Peter, it's all yours. Well, I will echo uh, Adam's uh, appreciation for people to take the time to, to, to think together about, uh, about this, this idea of a lawyers advising their clients to apologize and forgive. Uh, Adam has been a good friend. And uh, when Adam called me up and said, Peter, would you be willing to share this, this, uh, this uh, passion that you have? Uh, I couldn't have been happier, partly because whenever I can do, whenever I can do something that Adam wants me to do, that's always a good thing. Uh, but it is just a joy to, to share this with you. Um, let me, uh, let me start by saying why I why I think it's so important for lawyers um, to be well versed in uh, an apology and forgiveness that uh, that as clients come to us and they're in some kind of situation they've been traumatized they've been victims of injustice or sometimes they've been accused of, of perpetrating injustice that for us to to um, to help them think through you know their strategies and uh, and and frankly the apology strategy sometimes is is profoundly healing for people and and maybe handles things very very quickly up front um, it kind of blends with the crisis management field as far as uh, what do we do when uh, maybe we made some mistakes um and uh, and on the forgiveness side when when our clients have been victimized in some way you know that we are going to get them the compensation that they're entitled to under the law but how many of us have represented clients that and we've been very happy with the financial outcome but the client still says you know it just wasn't very satisfying um maybe they say yeah i thought they would have apologized but instead they've paid significant fun funds with, without any admission of wrongdoing which is kind of standard operating procedure so the long and the short of it is for us to be a part of our clients lives and helping them think beyond the elements of a cause of action and to be um a a counselor at law uh, and, and to include the ability to, to think through and, to, and for us to be mindful and, and frankly expert at, uh, at apology and forgiveness. So let me jump in. <clears throat> I want you to know about about 10, 12, 15 years ago, uh, I looked at the curriculum at, at Pepperdine's dispute resolution program. We had 30 courses in dispute resolution. We had psychology, we had cross-cultural, we had all these things, but I felt like we missed the soul and, and that, that there was a, a dimension here uh, that was about recovery, about healing. Um, and as, as I tried to chase that thought, uh, what I ended up coming up with was a theme of apology, forgiveness and reconciliation. And I ended up um, creating a class for that. <clears throat> And, and, and frankly, I'm emeritus, but I still go back to teach that class because I love encouraging future lawyers um, and mediators to, to, to think and to be mindful in that. Uh, I'll let you know that one of my, mission, one of my missions in life is to, uh, to, to share that class with, uh, with any other teacher. So if you're a teacher and you think, you know what, I, I, I might have a platform to be able to teach high schoolers, college students, uh, law students, uh, lawyers um, about, uh, about apology and forgiveness. Um, if, you, if you email me at peter.robinson at pepperdine.edu um, uh, and send me a snail mail address, I'll pop a copy of, a, a, of the book that put together the course materials and it's kind of off the shelf uh, uh, package for you to teach similar materials. So, so let's get after it. After all of that, my, uh, my, my best laid plan for my submit here. Uh, here we go. My PowerPoint consists of paper and, and ink. So here we are. The first question is, you know, let's define apology. What is an apology? 
And to do that, I'm going to ask us to be mindful of the fact that I think there's two elements that define different meanings of apology. One of the elements is, did I do something that hurt someone? It, 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 was my behavior affected someone in a way to where they're worse off than when I found them? So did I harm someone? And, and the second element is, was it wrong for me to have done that? Notice that it's really, really important because as I've talked to different people about apologies at different times, most of the time they say, I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, well, okay, that's fine. I admit, maybe you didn't do anything wrong. Maybe what you did was appropriate and necessary. Um, but if you hurt someone, maybe there's still something that you could say that would be balm, that would be healing. So, so, so the, the types of apology that comes from these two different factors is that if both of them are very strong, yes, I know that I did something that hurt someone and it was wrong for me to do it, we're out here on the chart, and that's a remorse apology. That's, that's an apology that condemns yourself and condemns behavior. Um, you differentiate your aspirational self from your actual self, and sometimes you are not the person that you desire to be. Sometimes you're tired, you lose your temper, you're, you're, and, and there you are needing to say, yeah, I know that I spoke harshly and, and, and uh, I, know I, I did something that was not the golden rule, right? And you know what? And I'm willing to admit with you that, that it was wrong for me to do that. I want to make sure we have shared values and that you know that we both agree that was wrong and I'm sorry. Um, so, so there's an I'm sorry that, that is, a, I'm going to call it a remorse apology, but it, it, is, a, it, it is very strong on both these elements. Well, let's start, to, let's start to thin slice it. What about those situations to where you did something, but you're not willing to say it's wrong? Um, uh, one of the classic examples is the, uh, the people who repair the, the street. And, and they're, they put up a sign saying the street's closed. Uh, we have to repair the sewer. Um, and, uh, and sorry for the inconvenience, right? Well, let me ask. They're saying we know that we've inconvenienced you. But is it wrong for them to do that? I think most of us would say, well, no, nobody wants raw sewage going down the street. So, so for them to periodically have to repair the sewers, uh, uh, but notice they're still sorry. And, and so, so what are they trying to communicate? They're trying to communicate regret. I guess another example is if you're a leader of, of first responders, somebody has to work Christmas morning. Um, uh, our operation is open for business. We need to be serve the public on Christmas morning. You had to write someone's name down who's going to staff Christmas morning. Um, whoever you, whose name you wrote down, you know what? They're going to be angry and say, why'd you write me down? I got, I got little kids, you know? And, and you're going to say, you know what? You're right. I did write your name down, but I had to write someone's name down. Um, and I look back and, and you hadn't worked at Christmas in three years, you know, every three years you should expect to have to work at Christmas if you're going to be a, a police officer or a healthcare worker or what have you. So, so there you are thinking about times to where you might express uh, an apology, but it's not self-condemning. In fact, you might go out of your way to say, let me be very clear here. Um, uh, I don't think I did anything wrong. I agree that I, I did something that, 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 that you wish I didn't do and, and, and it had a negative impact on you, but, but that was my job. Um, it was the right thing to do. Um, in fact, it may not be your job, but just also maybe a situation to where you chose to confront someone and they are angry that you confronted them, say, you know what, I wanted to have an honest relationship. So I, I, I don't think it was wrong for me to do that. Um, I thought that you were insensitive when you behaved that way and, and I, I wanted you to know that. And, and there you are and they go, well, you really hurt my feelings. Well, I regret that I hurt your feelings and I'm sorry for that. Um, but just so you know, uh, I don't, I'm not willing to say that my behavior is inappropriate. Um, so notice we have remorse and regret depending on how much responsibility, how much we're willing to condemn the behavior, right? But there's another whole dimension of apology, and that's if neither of these are present. Um, and there are times where many of us have, have apologized when we didn't think we did anything wrong, and we even think that the other person's being overly sensitive, and that we didn't think our behavior merited needing to, to even apologize. But we did because um, the relationship was important. Uh, or maybe there were a group of people around a Thanksgiving table and, and you crap made, a, made a, a political joke that you thought was humorous, but you have a distant relative who took great offense. And now suddenly there's a lot of tension and you know the only way to de-escalate this is for you to apologize to your distant, distant relative and say, you know, Uncle John, uh, clearly I've, I've touched a raw nerve here. I'm, I'm sorry. This was a family gathering. People 
don't, don't see each other that often. Some have traveled distance. You know, I'd like to return to a festive mood as compared to, you know, a, a tension filled room uh, regarding political discourse. So, um, so please accept my apologies and let's move on. Um, I want you to know this social harmony apology, many people, um, especially in the United States, feel that it lacks integrity. Uh, it's not honest because you don't think you did anything wrong. So, so the the presumption that that the that the apology is admitting that you did something wrong, that it's more like the remorse apology. This apology is more, frankly, just to kind of smooth things over and to try and get along with people. And and um, and and many of us say, you know, I don't like this apology. I feel like it's uh, it's either superficial or or. Uh, uh, it just doesn't leave a good, I don't feel like I've been honest with the other person when I give that apology. Well, that's interesting because a whole bunch of the world, this is very dominant uh, push to apology. Uh, that, that in much of Asia, the most important thing is harmony. And, and, uh, and, and for us to maintain harmony is very, very important to the community. So the idea of, uh, of saying you're sorry for the good of the group, the well-being of the team as compared to having individual integrity that, uh, that I've had many students from Asia tell me that, uh, you know, in my world, the social harmony apology is the most honorable apology. It's the most virtuous, um, which might be different from those of us from a rugged individual kind of a U.S. background that says that, you know, I'm not sure that I'm being, uh, being honest with the social harmony apology. So in any event, there's three different times. Every, every time a person says, I'm sorry, but three very different meanings. And, and, uh, and again, one of the things I'm hoping is that as we dive into apology, that we coach people how to, how to express what they genuinely believe and feel um, uh, and, and to be uh, more willing to, to describe. Uh, so, so notice with me, one of the questions is, sometimes uh, people will say they're sorry to, uh, to end the conversation. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm sorry, right? So is, is the apology the end of the conversation? For some people, the apology is the beginning of the conversation. I'm sorry. And now we have a conversation about, well, sorry, do you, do you admit that that behavior was wrong, that it shouldn't be repeated? Um, three criteria for a good apology. One of them is their remorse. Uh, another criteria, completely different, is will the behavior be repeated? Um, and then a third one is, did it meet the needs of the victim? Um, and there are people who study apology and who say that, you know what, any one of those criteria has legitimacy. Um, so if you give a social harmony apology and Uncle John settles down and says, okay, thank you, Peter, you know, let's get back to enjoying each other. Okay, aye, aye, Captain, let's, uh, let's, let's, not, let's not get lost in the weeds here and let's move on and remember that, that we are a family that loves each other. So, okay, so there's three models, three, three meanings of apology. Right, <clears throat> but as we continue to try and say, I want to, I want to, I want to unwrap apology. I want to look at the motives for apology. What are the motivations? And we have two categories. We have internal and we have external. All right. As we look at internal motives, it might be empathy that we understand that we've impacted someone negatively and we want to attend to that. All right. I'm not going to worry about that. All right. I want to talk about guilt. Um, some of the people that I've studied when I started chasing this idea of apology um, were mental health professionals and having an economics background and straight to law school. I, I, Whenever mental health professionals start to write about things, that I, you know, I, I, I try to pay close attention because uh, I know that I'm not formally studied in that area. Um, so the fact is, you know, we step back and say, you know what, the reason we sometimes apologize is to relieve our guilt which is really fascinating because now suddenly we're looking at apology as something that we do for the, for the perpetrator. Uh, it helps him or her process their mistake um, as compared to being a gift to the victim to help them, re to reinstate them and help them recover. Um, but as we step back and look at guilt, you know, the, uh, the mental health, some of the people that I read said, well, you only, if you have guilt, you have three options. You can pretend that it didn't happen. Many of us have, alive, have arrived 10 minutes late to a lunch appointment, and we walk into the restaurant, we sit down, we know we're 10 minutes late, but we don't tell the person across the table, Adam, I want you to know I have a watch, I notice I'm 10 minutes late, I've, I'm sorry, um, that was inconsiderate, and I, I, we don't do that. Instead, I sit down and say, Adam, have you had the chicken enchiladas here? Oh, they're to die for, and, and we move right through it. Why? Because it's embarrassing to admit that we make mistakes and that, and that we are insensitive sometimes. So, uh, so we can pretend, um, 
Or better yet, you know, I'm talking to a bar association, a bunch of lawyers, right? We can rationalize. Um, and uh, the classic rationalization is, well, it's, it's, it, it, uh, everybody does it. Uh, or, or it's not that big of a deal. Uh, and, and there you are, as you state, what am I going to do with this guilt? Many of us uh, go through some kind of mental gymnastics to justify that, uh, that whatever we did was, was, was not that bad or everyone does it. And, and therefore we are normalizing. Um, uh, okay, so rationalization. And then the third option is to apologize. And then in fact, one of the, first of all, why is it hard to apologize? One of the, the sound bites for apology that I love is that it's about telling the truth to myself and others and taking responsibility. What part of that equation is hard for most of, for many of us, excuse me, is hard for me, is telling the truth to myself because I either want to rationalize it or I just want, and, and, and for me to be willing to, to look in the mirror and frankly, to have a positive self-image and then to get a piece of data that I'm insensitive in some way, and, and that, that data is inconsistent with how I see myself. So sometimes I just refuse to accept it. Um, and, uh, and, and the, Gide the uh, Difficult Conversations book talks about, uh, talks about three layers to every conflict. It's, it's the facts, it's the feelings that come from the facts, and then it's the identity. Are you saying I'm a bad employee? Are you saying that I don't carry my weight? That I'm not a good team member? Uh, is that what? And, and the question, what does this conflict say about who I am? Well, in the same way, when someone gives me some negative data, right, I have this picture of myself as being a decent person. And now for me to, uh, for me to be willing to have a more complicated identity of myself. Yeah, I'm a decent person. And I also make mistakes. Yes, I'm, I'm usually, yes, I try to be sensitive and considerate to others, right? And sometimes I'm not intentionally. Um, and sometimes I'm not accidentally. And now suddenly I am, I'm able to get negative feedback and to attach it to who I am um, as compared to having to reject it and say, that can't be true. I'm a, I'm a decent person. So, so we, have this, we have this situation here of, of my conscience indicts me, all right? Um, and now I'm going to do something with it. Uh, I think that apologizing is the most healthy. Um, as we, and we step back, but to get over it though, we have to get over the ego, the, the ability to admit uh, our mistakes. Um, so, so, so there's a package of, of motives that help us dive deeper into, into, into the challenges of encouraging people to apologize. Um, uh, but there's an external motivator also, right? And this is the, the, to mitigate consequences. Um, the consequences might be financial, reputation, it might be uh, some kind of a punishment. Every toddler, you know, knows that, uh, that, you know, when they push a button too far, then the parent decides, you know, I, I'm going to do some discipline here. You know, as you see the parents start to lead the child to the, the, the back part of the house, that, you know, you hear the child say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, why is this four-year-old suddenly very sorry? Well, he knows he's about to get some kind of punishment and that uh, and the contrition is a good way to mitigate uh, the punishment. So, uh, okay, so so here we are looking at, by the way, what does this do? The external apology, we have to add that to our chart. Now we have a menu, we have the remorse apology, the regret apology, the social harmony apology, and now we have another apology that says, you know what, I might be a sociopath. I have no conscience. I don't care about anyone but me. But you know what? I'm in a predicament here. And guess what? I think that um, I think that I think that I might get. I might not be punished as severely for my mistake if I apologize. I mean, most recently we've had uh, we've had Will Smith, right? And there he is, the night of the Oscars, and 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 <clears throat> he when he receives his Oscar, he apologizes to the Academy, but he doesn't apologize to Chris Rock, right? Um, the next day he apologizes to Chris Rock. And, uh, and if you go back and look at those apologies, you know, you see that, uh, and, and by the way, and he also resigned from the, from the academy. Um, and, and here he is punishing himself to show people that, you know what, now was that externally motivated? Could he see the punishment coming? Or does he strive to, in fact, encourage people to be loving and kind and, and those kinds of things? Uh, that's what he said in his apology. You know, I, I want to stand for, 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 lo for love and kindness. And, and, and I know that I messed up last night. Um, so, so there you have the, uh, the now, we have, now we have a menu of four types of apologies. Uh, now let's take a look at uh, 
All right, so how to apologize. Uh, as we look at how to apologize, uh, it starts with uh, acknowledging the, the acknowledging the injury, right? So we acknowledge, right? Notice what we don't do. It's not vague. Sorry for that thing. No, we need to name what it is. In fact, again, I, I usually have uh, um, four or five weeks into my, in my semester long class, I'll have usually a woman uh, law student say, my boyfriend hates that I'm taking this class, right? And I say, oh, right, I'll play, you know, why does your boyfriend hate that you're taking this class? Well, we used to have arguments and then he would apologize and then we'd go back to being okay, right? Um, uh, but now, you know, as she goes, we had an argument last week, he apologized. And I said, what are you apologizing for? He goes, I'm not really sure. I don't know what I did, but I know you're mad at me and I, I just wanted to go away. So, so I'm sorry, right? And the vague apology, no, I mean, the, the contrary apology is, you know, it was a staff meeting yesterday, folks. You know what? I lost my composure. I said things that were really mean spirited to one of our members. This person has done many things that have been outstanding for our team. And, uh, and I, and I minimize, the, minimize that person. And I want everyone to know that I, I apologize to him privately, but because I embarrassed him in front of everyone, I wanted to get the staff together again and for everyone to know that, that I was wrong to have done that. And, and, and I want everyone to know that I have great respect and appreciation for, and there I am naming what I did. You know, I lost my temper, I used language and, and there you are um, being specific about what, what, you're, what you see was the offense that, 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 you, that, you, that, you, uh, that you committed. Okay, not conditional. How often have you heard someone apologize to say, if, uh, if that hurt anyone's feelings, I'm sorry. Notice that that is almost as much an indictment as it is an apology. Instead of taking responsibility, I'm almost accusing you of being thin-skinned. I'll put a little sauce on it, okay? Well, if that hurt anyone's feelings, okay, I'll be the bigger person. I'll say I'm sorry, right? And suddenly you're, you're puffing yourself up instead of humbling yourself and admitting a mistake. So this idea of the conditional apology uh, is, is, is a false start. Um, in fact, one, some of the authors describe some of these things as, as a verbal sleight of hand. You're going to try to give the apology, but at the end, you end up throwing in some condition, uh, conditional language. And why do we do that? Because it's hard to humble yourself, and we're trying to save some self-respect instead of just embracing the fact that I blew it yesterday. Uh, okay, uh, don't minimize the don't minimize the the, the offense. Right, you, the whole theme here is you want to acknowledge it. Don't say, "Well, it's really not that big of a deal," but I'm sorry. Right, that's double speak. Uh, if it's not a big deal, then 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 uh, then you don't need to be sorry. Uh, but if you behave in a way that that, that you know didn't meet your expectations of yourself. Um, that, uh, that, that suddenly, you know, if you're gonna bring it up, it, it, it's a big deal. Um, I took my family to Hawaii a couple of years ago and we went um, jet lining or something, what do they, what do they call that? Uh, zip lining, went, went zip lining, we had a great time. Um, I had kids and grandkids. Uh, uh, it cost me about a grand to go do this, this, this day of, of adventure, um, which was fine. And we had a lot of fun, it was no problem. But when I got home and looked at my credit card, the company ran my credit card twice. Um, so I got to pay two grand for, uh, for this, this great fun. Um, and, uh, and I called the company and I said, hey guys, you know, we had a good time, but uh, we thought the price was a thousand, not 2000. And the woman on the phone looks it up. She goes, oh my gosh. Mr. Robinson, I am so sorry. This is this is terrible. This is unprofessional. We had glitches in the system. I, I can't tell you. And, and I said, well, just, I want you to know, I'm not looking for anyone to die on the sale. I, I just hope that you're going to reverse one of those charges. But she she magnified how terrible it was that they had done this to, to the point to where I'm saying, you know, it's really okay. Um, uh, you know, all I want you to do is to correct it. I don't want you to emotionally punish yourself. Or you're, uh, so notice with me, she magnified it instead of minimize it. If she goes, oh, Oh, well, it's really not that big a deal. Why don't you just pay two thousand? Kind of like, what do you mean it's not that big a deal? That 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 that, 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 that just makes me matter. And notice that here I am trying to figure out what my reaction is going to be. All right, not the passive voice. The passive voice, classic celebrities, and you know. By the way, once you get sensitive to apology, it's all it's all over the news. It's everywhere. The passive voice says mistakes were made, as compared to what I made a mistake. 
mistakes were made sounds like the universe somehow came together in some conspiracy to to cause me to act stupid yesterday um uh, and for me to really take responsibility i need to put this in the first person language so if we're going to acknowledge there are four pitfalls to avoid express remorse if it's honest, if you have remorse, right? If you're willing to say that, you know what, I deeply disagree with how I, with how I behaved yesterday, uh, th then you can say that. But maybe that's not intellectually honest. Maybe you don't have that. Sometimes you might promise forbearance. You know, I want to know, I realize now how some people were so wounded by that, that you have an oath for me that I will not do that again uh, with, 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 you know, uh, and there you are, um, uh, not willing to say that what I did was wrong, but say I won't repeat the behavior. Okay, uh, next one is an explanation. You got to be careful here, because the explanation can very quickly sound like what? A justification. So you have to say there's no excuse for what I did yesterday. Um, uh, that no one should be treated that way. And, and I, I recognize that. And, and the, again, what Wilson has said, violence is never the answer. Um, uh, but you might then be able to give an explanation and say, I want, I want you to know that it makes a difference. Um, I think the reason that I acted so poorly was because you know, I've been at, the, at a hospital. I had a family member who was, you know, we were up all night and, and I was ex exhausted when, when I behaved badly. Um, and maybe that may matters to someone. You might ask people for permission. Is it okay if I give an explanation? Or would you, uh, there are times when my wife says, Pete, you always have a good reason. I don't want to hear it. You know, uh, okay, all right. And then I'll, I'll, I'll sit on my good reason. Um, okay, whatever. And, that, and the last one is reparations. Sometimes we think of the, are we giving an apology trying to get out of taking responsibility? But if, if the apology is telling the truth to others and myself and taking responsibility, the apology needs to say, and by the way, you know, if there's been a financial consequence to my behavior, you know, I will make it right. I will, uh, you know, uh, I, I believe in justice and, and doing the right thing and doing the right thing is that you shouldn't have to pay for my mistakes. So if, the, if it's not financial, if it's, you know, sometimes there are things that are symbolic, you know, I want everyone to know that, uh, that you know, we're going out, the, the whole office is going out to lunch today and I'm buying because, you know, I, I want to do that uh, to show you uh, how seriously I take um, this, 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 this apology. Apology. And there you're doing some kind of symbolic reparations. I'll buy a round of drinks or all. And there you are trying to uh, let people know that you're serious about, about it. So that's the how to apology. But now we get to let's talk about advising others to apologize. As we look at that, you know, we have a pragmatic and a moral analysis to, to look at. On the pragmatic, there are risks to apologizing, right? And by the way, in my travels, you know, I, I, you know, I, I describe a rear ender, and and uh, and and I'm one of your family members, you know, runs into the back of another car on the freeway at two miles an hour, at ten miles an hour. Okay, so we're guessing not serious damages, uh, but the fact is, is that you know, then your family member calls you and says, you know, should I call him? Should I tell him I'm sorry? Should I tell him I'll pay for the bumper? Should I? and 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 you know, it's almost a knee jerk reaction that once we've been legally trained, no, don't do that. Uh, why? Well, because we're admitting liability. Does the apology admit liability? Um, and when you say you're sorry, are you conceding the fact that you were negligent? And that uh, so, so admitting liability is a big fear here. The other fear is the impact on insurance. On insurance. Um, that as lawyers, we know that you know you've uh, in the world in which we live, uh, you have it purchased protection, and in your in your contract with your insurer, you have an expectation that you're going to assist your insurer of uh, of uh, of um, of, of uh, assessing the claim, and that you're not going to concede. You know that. The, and by the way, notice how how che how cheap it is um, for me to to get out of the car and say, you know what, this is all my fault. We'll take full responsibility. Well, you know. Um, it's easy for me to do because it's not my money. It's the insurance company's money. But because of the way the insurance companies write their contracts, if I were to get out of the car and accept full responsibility, um, the insurance company, when I call them up and tell them, hey, I'm sure I ran into someone, this way, and then I get to that part of the story, then I'd say, well, Mr. Robinson, that, that's very generous of you. And, you know, and, and, you know, you will take full responsibility because what you just did gets us off the hook. You know, we're not going to pay 
<clears throat> when you take full responsibility. Uh, we want to do our investigation and come to our conclusions. Thank you very much. Um, that's very interesting because to apologize uh, could create some issues about waiving your, your insurance, but some of the people that I've seen right on this say to get out of the car and to tell the truth to say I didn't see the stop sign. I can't go so far as to say I accept full responsibility, but I can tell the truth. I didn't see the stop sign. Um, uh, and, and now suddenly when I call my insurer and say, I want you to know, I, I, I got a car, I told him I didn't see the stop sign. He's going to say, oh, did you tell him that? Yeah, I did. Well, guess what? You know, if, if it's true at the accident scene, it's going to be true when I give my statement to, to my insurance company, um, and it's going to be true uh, when I get my deposition taken, it's going to be true at trial. Uh, I mean, what happened, happened. Uh, so this idea of uh, uh, these are the risks, though. These are the reasons that we as lawyers are gun shy about encouraging people to apologize. This, I think, is probably second nature to almost everyone on this call. This column over here is the part that I hope to challenge you to be thoughtful about just to be smart, okay? I just want you to be smart about this, this question. Should we advise someone to apologize? And, and when we look at that, I want you to know, not apologizing is sometimes described as the second injury. You the first injury is that you were texting while driving and you ran into somebody, okay? That, that's negligence, okay? Um, the second injury is that you aren't admitting it and that you're pretending like it didn't happen that way. Um, and, uh, and some people say, you know, people might forgive a mistake, but they have a hard time forgiving a cover up. Uh, so, so, so realize if we follow classic legal advice and just kind of circle the wagons and see what they can prove, um, um, uh, just know that they, they, were, they were poking them in the eye and saying, you know, go ahead, prove up, let's see what you got. And, and some people, and by the way, well, in fact, we'll get to it. I think we increase the likelihood of being sued. This was documented in the world of medical mal stuff to where if, uh, they have some unexpected outcome that, uh, you know, the doctor goes, oh, my gosh, you know, I, I nicked a nerve or something, right? Um, if the doctor does, excuse me, historic behavior was that the doctor realizes he made a mistake and, and, is, and is afraid of suit. Because they're afraid of being sued, he or she withdraws, doesn't lean into the patient. In fact, they're embarrassed and they, and they, they avoid the patient. Well, the patient interprets that as he either doesn't know or he doesn't care that I'm, I'm my recovery is being compromised here and something's not right. And, 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 you know, why is my doctor acting like a, like, like, like so distant, right? Um, and they interpret that as he doesn't know or he doesn't care. And now notice with me what some victims are like, myself included, right? Is that then we go through a thought process that says, you know what? Someone needs to teach him or her a lesson. This isn't how you treat people. And then we begin to think about, you know, is, is, is this my mission on earth? Uh, is that my, my role to, 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 to maybe bring the lawsuit that, that makes this person uh, deal with what, with what he or she did? Um, and instead of denying it and, and, uh, and, and pretending, um, uh, you know what, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're, we're gonna, we're gonna hold them accountable. Um, notice that part of the reason I'm more inclined to hold them accountable is because he or she's not holding themselves accountable. If they come in and say, I want you to know, I made a mistake yesterday and I feel terrible, right? Do, do, is there a thought in my mind that says, Peter, you need, you need to teach these people a lesson? No, because they're teaching themselves a lesson, right? But it's the person who comes in, who makes a mistake and comes in and acts like they haven't. And then, that, then there's a voice in my head that says, you know, should, is it my role on the planet to teach these people a lesson? And I think, the, at least in the medical world, it's documented that sometimes doctors get sued for how they act after the, after the mistake. Okay. Uh, indignation is a barrier to settlement. Once you've gotten, once you've denied all wrongdoing, right? Uh, now, well, let's let's have a conversation about what kind of compensation you're looking for. Well, they're mad at you now. They're mad at you twice. Once for texting while driving, and the second one for pretending like you didn't. All right. Um, uh, and then also a, another one that that uh, some experienced trial lawyers pointed out to me is that, huh, there there might be an ultimate decision maker. A judge, a jury, an arbitrator, someone might eventually have to look at this whole situation, right? Um, and, uh, and, and a person who makes a mistake and doesn't apologize, um, I have a 
plaintiff's lawyer who took my class, who's, you know, got over a hundred million dollars of verdicts and settlements. And he says, I love to put a defendant on the, on the, on the stand and at trial and say, you know, at, at the accident scene, did, did you get out and ask if they're okay? Did you get out and, and, and say, and, and frankly, have a series of questions that, that show that this person was so afraid of getting sued that, that they didn't, they didn't act very human. Very, they didn't act very likable. Um, and, and I know one trial attorney who, who revels in being able to, to, to embarrass defendants for, uh, for acting like jerks. Um, so, so, so there's just a, on a pragmatic level, we haven't even gotten to the whole question of, of, of morals yet, but I want us to see that sometimes circling the wagon isn't smart. And all I'm asking for is, is a, um, a, a fair fight in your head that when you're talking to a client who's been accused of something for you to think through, you know, what's the likelihood they're going to be able to prove this anyways? Um, and, uh, and, and, and are we positioned better by putting cards on the table early and showing integrity and showing likability? Uh, or, or, or is it better for us just to, to hunker down and, and, uh, and, and encourage our client to hunker down and, and, and put our head in the sand and, and, and see, see what happens. Um, there's a newspaper article from the LA Times that's included in the book. Um, it describes a situation with uh, Paris Hilton. And, uh, and back when she was having some, some challenges uh, with, uh, I think, driving under, under the influence or something, um, she had like two or three of those kinds of claims. And, and, uh, and, and finally, a judge said, okay, you know what, you're going to have to serve time. Uh, this is your third one of these things. And, and we're not, you know, it's time for you to go to jail. Um, and, and she and her lawyer just cried how she's being so mistreated because she's a celebrity. Well, over the weekend, right, and then the LA Times comes in and says, well, I should know that, that Hilton has adopted a new, a new strategy. It's contrition. She got a new lawyer, um, and, and, that, uh, and now she is saying, you know what, my behavior was wrong. It was irresponsible, you know, I, I, and I should be punished for it. I should be punished the same as every other person. It shouldn't be any more or any less because I'm a celebrity. Um, and, and this whole picture of, of, of a, a different approach to the public um, as compared to I'm being victimized because I'm a celebrity uh, turned into, you know what, I should be punished because I, I, did, I did things that were not, they were antisocial, uh, but I should be punished the same, not more. Not. And so anyways, um, um, the idea of, of lawyers encouraging the client sometimes to say, you know, let's let, let's admit that that uh, that you have some mud on your hands here. So so here we are looking at this from a uh, from a purely pragmatic. Okay, I don't have any I don't have any values in this yet. So now let me ask some que some moral questions. All right, uh, some of the people. Uh, okay, let me ask. Uh, you have a 17 year old in your household, and uh, he or she. Uh, comes in late one night and says, mom, dad, uh, yeah, uh, I want you to know I scratched the neighbor's car, you know, uh, 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 parking. Um, and, uh, but I want you to know, no one knows it. I've already looked at the car. I've checked to make sure there's no paint, you know, pieces. Uh, I, I, no one can prove it. So, uh, so I, I think we dodged this one, right? If you're the parent of this child, uh, what, is, what is good parenting? It's usually pretty, Pretty, pretty much agreed upon the good parenting is to tell your child that you are going to go tell your neighbor, but, but, but they can't prove it. It doesn't matter what they can prove. And, and the question is, why do, as a parent, do we encourage our child to tell the truth? Because the parent is responsible for the moral development of their child. They want to raise a, a decent human being, a person who will be a good member of, of, of the community. And, uh, and, and they want to teach him or her that, you know, that we take responsibility when we make mistakes. Okay, so, so there's parenting. And now let's move it over to lawyers. Someone comes in and says, you know what? We didn't, uh, we didn't give people their breaks and their lunch hours, right? Um, uh, what should we do here, right? Uh, well, I mean, again, the knee-jerk reaction from lawyers is like, well, don't admit it. Uh, let's see what they can prove. Well, guess what? The time records are going to be available. That they're going to be able to prove their case. Um, and, and, and are we better off, um, uh, excuse me, does the lawyer, are we better off is a pragmatic question. Mike, the other question is, does the lawyer have any part as far as the moral development of his or her client? Are you concerned that your client be encouraged by you? I would encourage us to do this. I think you'd be better off, but even if it blows up in your face, it's the right thing to do. 
let's tell the truth uh, and take responsibility. And um, this is, maybe you say, oh, Peter, this is simplistic. Well, I want you to know that, that some of the people who write about this say that, that guilt can evolve into shame. And the differentiation they make is that, that uh, a person has guilt if, over an incident. Uh, yesterday, I told, yesterday, I told a lie. Okay. Um, over time, it becomes identity. It becomes, I'm a liar. Um, and, uh, and it's a dim diminished self-view that evolves, you know, as we encourage people not to tell the truth and not to take responsibility. So for us to be mindful of classic legal advice and how it might be impacting people and their, and their mental health, um, and also just to have the satisfaction that, you know what, I made a mistake, but, but I acted honorably after I made my mistake. Um, I'm angry that I made my mistake, but frankly, I, I feel pretty good about myself about what I did after I, and again, for us to think about the moral dimension of telling the truth and taking responsibility. Okay, let's keep on here. Uh, well, there's advising. So notice with me, what do we do about the admitting liability? Well, I don't know if you know it or not, but there are apology statutes in about half the states, including California, um, uh, and that we should be knowledgeable about what the apology statutes are. Uh, I'll tell you, in California, the apology statute uh, says that um, uh, regarding an accident, not an employment situation or a vendor or a commercial contract, I think, but if this is an accident, that people can express benevolence. What kind of an apology is that? Oh. Well, you know, that, that, that's a social harmony apology. They can get out and say, I'm sorry, I hope you're going to be okay. Uh, and uh, as compared to, I'm sorry, because the California statute explicitly says, if I admit fault, you know, that is, that is admissible. Um, but my general benevolence kind of, uh, I'm so sorry, and I hope you're going to be okay, that is not admissible to prove liability. Uh, if you can't prove your case other than that, then you can't prove your case. Um, uh, okay, uh, and, the, and you should study the California statute. But let me give you the contrast. In British Columbia, the statute in Canada says that, um, that, that all, all situations, not just an accident, but all any apology, and by the way, even fault admitted apologies are not admissible to prove liability. So all apologies in all situations, and the can, can, and the British Columbia statute also says, and by the way, um, uh, any apology will, cannot affect the insurance coverage. Um, so they said, if you want to write insurance in our jurisdiction, you know what, uh, we're Canadian, we get to apologize. So, uh, so, so just to, to think about apology statutes as something that we as lawyers should be mindful of and aware and, and look at and consider how much do we risk as far as the, uh, the admitting liability situation, depending on the type of apology. We can't go to a remorse apology to where we say, you know what, we messed up, it was wrong for us to do it, but we can definitely give a regret apology and says, you know what, I know your car is damaged. I know that you're, you, you appear to be in some pain. You know what, you know, I, I regret, I'm sorry that you are, are suffering. Um, and then because of the California statute, that's as far as we can go if we want a, a safe apology. But the other safe apology options are to go to mediation. Um, and they use mediation confidentiality as a place. And frankly, if you see something brewing, you might want to tell your client, you know what? I recommend we get to mediation pre-suit. And I recommend that, you know, let's, let's take the high road and, and, uh, and, and admit the truth. Um, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to document through discovery eventually anyway. So let's just put it on the table now and, uh, and, and try to put this to bed quietly before there's even a suit. Uh, and there you are uh, using mediation. Now, again, if it blows up, uh, okay, well, that happened in mediation. So it's not admissible for, for uh, any purposes in California. The other thing uh, we might do is use the attorney as the apology mouthpiece. So um, uh, for the attorney, and we see it all the time in the news to where uh, in Southern California, gosh, a couple of years ago, I think it was a Taco Bell uh, executive, someone pretty high up in Taco Bell, um, had a, they had a videotape of him being very abusive to an Uber driver, um, and he lost his job. Uh, and the next day, his lawyer, he didn't come out and make it, but his lawyer came out and says, you know, my client feels terrible about it. You know, he was inebriated, and this is not who he is. And uh, again, he, the company decided still to sever uh, the relationship with them but uh but but there's a lawyer who chose to kind of be the face of the apology uh as compared to uh because the other the other option is that the lawyer might write the apology but let it be delivered by the client it'll be more satisfying if it's delivered by the client 
But again, I hope that, that, that you would consider that, you know, part of my job as a lawyer is, is to know how to write an apology and, and to write an apology that'll help my client, you know, accomplish his or her goals. Great. Maybe the apology delivers it, the client's, uh, excuse me, the attorney delivers the client's apology. We just talked about that. Um, let's see, maybe the attorney apologizes for the client's conduct. So notice up here, the attorney is saying, my client is sorry for his behavior, right? Maybe the attorney comes out and it's, again, is this a verbal sleight of hand when the attorney says, you know, I'm here, you know, I just met with my client. I, I want you to, I'm very sorry to Mr. Chris Rock and his family for, for what happened. That had to be humiliating and I feel terrible about it and, and I'm sorry, right? I'm not saying, I'm not saying Will Smith is sorry. Uh, again, notice that this is not as satisfying as, as, as that. Um, so for the client to be uh, uh, the one who's, who's apologizing is uh, more satisfying. And of course, the attorney also might negotiate the terms of the apology. Um, how much remorse has to be expressed? Um, is an explanation okay? If we apologize, will you accept the apology and forgive us? Because if we pre-script this thing and, and you know we know that we're going to apologize and then they're going to say, you know what, we know that this comes. Um, I don't know why I'm fixated on Taco Bell, but uh, another Taco Bell thing was a couple of years ago, some law firm down in Orange County sued them saying that, you know, the, that they don't put meat in their tacos. It's some kind of other thing that, that who knows what it is. Um, and, uh, and, and Taco Bell defended itself. And, and a few months later, the, the, the plaintiffs dropped their suit. Uh, they never admitted that they were wrong to bring the suit. They never apologized for the accusation. Um, and, uh, and, and again, Taco Bell then took out a full page ad saying, isn't it interesting that, you know, that these folks smear us uh, and then they just want to go away quietly without admitting they made a mistake. I was also amused when I was reading something about the New York Times and they do a retraction and they don't admit that what they did was wrong. Uh, they, they, they just say, well, you know, we're, we're going to retract that. And anyway, so there you go. All right, so there, there's some, some gist for the mail. Oh, I'll, we'll end on this one. Uh, there's, there's, there's more, but we'll end on this one. So what do you do as far as thinking about the client and the attorney's apology preferences? So the client might be pro-apology or, or against apology, and the attorney might be pro-apology and against attorney. Well, if both the attorney and the client think that the apology is a good st strategy, they're going to apologize. And likewise, if both the client and the attorney think that the apology is a bad strategy, they're not going to apologize, right? Um, notice with me, if the... Uh, if the attorney thinks that apology is a good idea, but the client thinks it's a bad idea, I think most of us are going to defer to the client. It's the client's risk. So, so we're going to defer to the client, right? Notice with me, this is the one that's interesting to me. What happens if the client comes to your office and says, you know what, I screwed up, uh, I dropped the ball. And the attorney says, you know, and, and he says, and you know, I just want to tell the truth and take responsibility. And the attorney says, you know what, it sounds naive to me. Uh, I think they might, they might try to take advantage of you if you do that. I would strongly recommend that you not, right? Notice up here when the attorney and the client differ that we defer to the client. But over here, when the attorney, when the client wants to apologize but the, the attorney doesn't like it, do we defer to the client? Or do we say, you know what? If you want me to represent you, you need to follow my advice. And my, my, and my experience is what you're trying to do here is not a wise path. Um, and, and do we do we convince the client not to do what, what is intuitive for him or her to, 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 to tell the truth and take responsibility? Okay, folks, you know what? I, uh, uh, I got a few more slides, but that's enough on forgiveness. I've already used three quarters of our time. I'm going to breathe here for, for three minutes and see if there's any, any comments, any questions, any reactions before I try to rush through, apology, uh, through forgiveness. There are a few questions here, Peter. I don't, can you see them on your end? I, I don't, see, I don't see, see I can... them, no. I'll, okay, so I'll, the first I'll question, you, you okay, the first question revisits the incident with Will Smith. And the question is, would there have been either, and, and a, what would, have, what would have been the appropriate response in that live incident at the Academy Awards? What would have been uh, an it, appropriate response? And it's interesting because we know from the LA Times that, that Chris, uh, that uh, I'm sorry, that Will Smith's manager had a chance to talk to him a few times before he got the, uh, the uh, before he took the Academy. 
uh, before he got the, his award. So, so if there would have been more time for the people who advised Chris, uh, Will Smith to advise, I hope that someone there would have had expertise with regard to apology and say, um, you know, apologizing to the Academy for creating a scene and, and for distracting, you know, uh, that's good, that's great, you know, but, but you also have to apologize to the immediate victim. And the immediate victim is Chris Rock. And you might be angry at Chris, um, but the fact is, Chris may have in fact contributed to the situation by 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 you know possibly you know crossing a line with your family. Uh, but do you agree that your be, your treatment of Chris was 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 less than what you aspire to be, less than the role model you want to be, less than you want the world to 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 uh, to adopt? Um, and if you are, you know, let me let me challenge you to uh, so that when he did his acceptance speech. For him to have acknowledged the wrong, I want you to know, I don't believe in violence. You know, I let my emotions get the better of me. It was wrong for me to do that. Um, a lot of the stuff that he did the next day after he cooled down, uh, for him to put that on the night and to apologize to Chris um, and to say, and, and by the way, the next day when he apologized, there were not reparations. Um, he didn't offer any self-punishment. Um, uh, three or four days later, he, he resigned from the academy. Right. Um, uh, for him that night, I mean, if, if he, and this is the thing about how stuff happens in real time and, and for us to get ahead of the to get ahead of the story is, is sometimes hard. Um, so but in a perfect world, I would have had him, you know, acknowledge, express remorse, uh, give an explanation um, and offer reparations um, to the Academy and to Chris, because they are both victims uh, as we uh, as as uh, and have him do that. You know, an hour, half an hour after after he 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 had uh, made the offense. That's Another my that's question. my thought. I don't know what you guys think. Another question is: um, this participant is asking how you would conceptualize contextualize an apology in relation to forgiveness. The person is talking about Jacques Derrida's philosophy of forgiveness, where he asks if there can be a sense of forgiveness without a shared language and commonality and meanings. Okay, uh, and I'll let you know that, that, you know, they've jumped ahead to the forgiveness piece. Uh, there are three models of forgiveness, and one of the models of forgiveness, uh, I, I take it from the work of, uh, of Fred Luskin, uh, who's a, a Stanford uh, psychology professor, and he, he heads their forgiveness project. It, one of his books is Forgive for Good. He describes a very unilateral approach to forgiveness, uh, that the victim apologizes, excuse me, the victim forgives for their own well-being. Uh, the, the perpetrator may never apologize. The perpetrator may either may never understand or they're just too proud to apologize. So the fact is, maybe you're going to be in a situation where someone says, you know what, I was treated wrongly. And, and you know the other side is never going to apologize. But for us to coach and challenge people to realize right now you have a victim mindset and, and Luskin has three suggestions. One of them is to create a hero story. Instead of being a victim, talk about how you survived the injustice as compared to were, were victimized by it and, and how you overcame. And so, so, so I don't think you, that forgiveness has to be tied. In my mind, apology is what perpetrators have to navigate and have to decide how they're going to handle it. Forgiveness is what victims have to decide what they're going to do. Those could be two unilateral acts. Um, now, there's another model of forgiveness that's called relational forgiveness, um, in which case the, uh, the you know, the, the, the both of the parties talk about how they contributed, but they tell a more complicated story, they do a lot of things. But the, the, in relational forgiveness, the objective is to put the relationship back together again. Um, and, and, and the people, one of the people who writes about this says, you cannot have one way forgiveness or one up forgiveness. If I forgive you, then I'm, I'm the benefactor and, and, you're, and you're the scoundrel. Um, and, uh, and therefore, you know, if we're gonna truly have a, a restoration of the relationship, you know, let's go back to a, a reciprocal uh, mutual respect as compared to one person always being able to hold it over the other person that don't forget you were unfaithful in our marriage. So anything I can do, if I spend more money than I should, just don't forget that you, it's kind of like, okay, well, you know, how's that gonna go for the next 10 years? So anyways. Two other quick questions. Well, or not so quick. Scott is wondering to hear some examples of how apologies may be effective in the course of a deal negotiation. In the course of a deal negotiation? So that they're trying yeah. to create a relationship. Right. Okay. I mean, again, to me, um, well, okay, I'll give you this one. Um, a number of years ago, uh, 
Pepperdine went over to China and, and was training some mediators uh, in partnership with the Beijing Arbitration Commission. Um, uh, we named a price that we wanted and they said, yep, we'll pay that. Uh, when I got there, um, I learned that, the, that there were 30, 40 people in the classroom, but the fact is that, that what lawyers in China would pay for that kind of experience was not what they would pay in the United States. And then in fact, the Beijing Arbitration Commission um, had to subsidize the course. Uh, and I called the dean back at Pepperdine. I said, you know what, I'd like to have a long-term relationship with these folks. And right now, you know, um, they're suffering because of the way we structured this. Um, uh, I don't expect them to have, want to have a long-term uh, deal where they suffer. Um, and I got permission from the dean and I went and talked to the executive director of the, of the Beijing Arbitration Commission. Said, you know what, we want to reduce our fee. We don't want you to have to subsidize this. If the most that lawyers in, in Beijing are, are accustomed to paying for this kind of a, a training experience is is a thousand U.S. dollars. Then you know what? Then we will that that will be adequate for our for our needs. So in in, in any event, it uh, there you are thinking about ways to where you you made a proposal they rejected it and helped you understand why that proposal might have been offensive, and for you to say I didn't realize some of the things that are going on in your organization, you know, please know I uh, I would have never made that proposal had I understood you know um, how it would. The impact it would have had, and and how it would have been so unfair to your to your team. Uh, I'm looking for for mutual respectful relationships. The last question is: How does apologizing work on a political level? And the examples given are South Africa and Rwanda, or Ukraine and Russia. Yeah, yeah. So apology on a political level. Yeah. That's probably a topic in and of itself. Yeah, it's. I mean, that, that, that that's a monster topic. Um, because don't forget, we talked about the identity, um, and uh, and and it's interesting because in a lot of a lot of regular conflicts, but especially international political com conflicts, both sides see them see themselves as the victim, and uh, and and interestingly, you know, Russia might be taking a a fifty year, you know time frame to kind of say 50 years ago, you know, I mean, we, we, we had this empire, you know, Gorbachev dismantled it, but uh, we have a lot of Russian speaking people and a lot of Russian culture. And, and there was, in some sense, there were ways in which we were, we were one people 50 years ago. And, and you know what, we yearn for the days to where, where we had more influence and more power and more prestige in the world. And, 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 you know, we want, we want to rewind the clock back 50 years ago. And therefore Putin, Putin feels like, you know, so, so now he feels like the victim. Is he going to humble himself and say, you know what, I was wrong. Uh, I don't think so. Um, uh, I mean, that's political suicide. So, so instead he'll continue to tell his constituencies that, you know, that, uh, that we're the victims here and that the Russian speaking people were not being treated appropriately by the Ukrainians. And, and we are going to stand up for the Russian speaking people. Um, and of course, Western Europe stands back and says, okay, yeah, granted, that was 50 years ago. But for the last 40 years, Ukraine has been a standalone country, it's you know, and the United Nations Charter says that we respect each other's boundaries. And so, so each side feels like the other one is. Uh, so how does apology work for that? Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> can, can I do 10 minutes on forgiveness? You, oh, we got like five to... minutes for forgiveness. Can I do five minutes on forgiveness? Sure. Or, or, sure. or should we just not worry about forgiveness? Let's just have the apology. It's, it's your call, Peter, if you want to do it five minutes now or, or if I can indulge you to come back a different day. <laughs> I'd be delighted to come back a different day. Uh, okay. But, but why, don't we do a part, why don't we do a part two then, if you're willing to do that? For us later on, if that Excellent. would be okay, Good. maybe we should do that. I know we told people we would end it at one yeah, thirty. You know, let, let me let, let let me just introduce forgiveness. Sure. By uh by by asking us to think. What is forgiveness? Is it an event? I hear people say, "I forgive." The last night, I I forgave you. Right, so it's almost like a, a, an event, or is it a process? Uh, I've heard people say, you know, uh, I'm, I, I want to forgive you. I'm, I'm going to forgive you, but right now I'm just too angry. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. So, so is it an event or a process? Is it a decision? Does it come from the head? National 
calculation to kind of say, you know, I'm, uh, forgiveness is what I, is is my path here, or or is it a feeling? You know what I. Uh, uh, I, I remember the good times. I remember all the good things about our relationship. I remember that I love you. And, and because of all of that, I forgive. So, so some people make decisions from their heart, other people from their head. You know, how does forgiveness work? Um, and the last one, is it unilateral or is it interdependent? Some people say, I can only forgive if there's an apology. And other people say, well, that makes me stay a prisoner to the injustice, you know, indefinitely. And I don't, you know, why should I give them that much more power? They already abused power over me once. And now if I give them the place to where I will only forgive you, you know, if you, uh, um, uh, I will only forgive you if, uh, if you apologize. Now suddenly, once again, they're in the driver's seat and I'm, I'm the passenger. So some people say, you know what, uh, I will forgive for my own sake, uh, whether you apologize or not. And again, these are just two contrasts. And frankly, forgiveness is, is fluid and flexible. And by the way, as lawyers, I pray that we're able to understand the depths of forgiveness with such fluidity that we can help people figure out for them how they approach it um, and how they think about it and what kind of a construct they need so they can embrace it, you know, with, uh, with, with, uh, with, with joy. Um, but stay with me because I think there's three measures of forgiveness. Animus, reparations, and future relationship. So when I say I forgive you, does that mean that I don't wish you, uh, you know what, after you hurt me, I wished you harm. Now I wish you well. Um, uh, reparations, I want, I want to be compensated fully. Well, now that, you've, now that I forgive you, I either want either partial or I, I waive all reparations. So if I borrow $500 and I forgive you uh, for not paying me back, do you still owe me 500 bucks? Uh, some people say yes, some people say no, uh, okay. But to me, the interesting one is the future relationship. And the person who says, you know what? I don't hate you and you don't need to pay me back, but I never want to see you again. Uh, and and it's, it's just, it's, it's toxic uh, for us to interact with each other. So let's just stay, stay away from each other. Um, and some people say that, that, that it's not really a forgiveness unless you have, have reconciled. And other people say, no, 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 you, you don't have to reconcile to experience forgiveness. Um, that sometimes boundaries, and, and it's very healthy to say, you know what, I want to go through some kind of forgiveness process for my own, well, me, my own mental health and well-being. Uh, but, you know, it would be foolish for me to be vulnerable to these people again. Um, they've taken advantage of me once. Why in the world would I go back to that? Uh, and, but notice with me, if we just use the word forgiveness, I think people think that it means all of these. It means I'm supposed to be vulnerable again. And, uh, and for us to thin slice forgiveness, and, and when we counsel our clients uh, about you know, how to navigate that, for us to give them permission to decide how vulnerable you know, they, they think they should be in this situation. So, um, so, 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 the, so there, there's just a teaser about thinking about the, the other side of this coin. Uh, perpetrators have to figure out apology and victims have to figure out forgiveness. Thank you, Peter. I I'm so grateful for your wonderful talk and hope you won't be able to join us down the line. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you all. Take care.